Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Siemens EDA with Gear Ida. I'm going to talk today about silicon lifecycle management. Gear, we've heard a lot about silicon lifecycle management, but as chips become more complicated, as we get more chiplets, as we start getting into 2.5D, 3D, what changes from the SLM side? So there, there are a couple of changes, there are a couple of things that are going on here. One in particular is with respect to how uh, chips are used. Historically, right, we would put high performance devices in laptops, low power devices in mobile, high quality devices in, in cars and like low cost devices in toys. And now you have use cases where we kind of push all of those requirements to the edge at the same time. Like in, in a data center, you want a high performance, low power device that lasts forever and it has low cost. All right. So that kind of means we have to live more on the edge in terms of we can't just over engineer our way out of the situation like we have to do something else that something else usually means we have to measure more things and doing that getting that visibility on exactly how a chip behaves is more challenging in context of a multi-die package because now you have to rely more on measurements and instrumentations that embedded inside the chiplets inside the die Let's take a closer look. Okay. So, Gear, what are we looking at? Well, so as, as we talked about, uh, SLM is trying to address situations where we have to deal with performance, power, reliability, and cost requirements like at the same time. And to do that, we have to be able to um, not just you know, see if our device is, is defective or functional, if it has a pulse or not, but get more insight into how healthy that device is. And really what that means is that we need to be able to uh, detect defects. We need to be able to identify bugs or performance related issues. We need to be able to observe the sign marginalities and also environmental factors like voltage and, and temperature. So the idea here is that we need to be able to kind of use, be able to detect all of these different let's just call it issues or, or problems. And um, to do that, we need to you know, have different mechanisms that allow us to, to detect and understand all of these, and then also do something with all of that information. And part of this is the fact that these devices are incredibly complicated, but they're also being used in unique ways too, right? So you think about thermal gradients that may be showing up on the chip. Those are because they're being used differently from some particular workload versus another workload. Yeah, and, and part of the challenge here is that, you know, if you look at this uni universe of issues uh, and the fact that we are, you know, need to address these through multiple stages of, of the life cycle, the, the actual requirement is going to vary a lot from one device to another, like what environment you, you operate the device in. Again, if it's a data center or a chip in a data center or a chip that goes into a car, a chip that goes into other space. And also what type of software workloads that you're running on if these are very complex uh, software loads that are going to change over the lifetime of the device, then you be able to uh, kind of analyze and optimize the software load is is very important and you need that type of visibility into the design. Uh, in other situations, you're more concerned about, let's say, uh, defects and, and aging, and you're looking for, you know, different types of issues uh, throughout the design. How much of this can actually be proactive? So you have a problem that you're starting to see it's starting to show up or your your signals are moving slower or some core is, is behaving differently than it used to. Now, what do you do about it? Can, can you actually start doing this kind of preemptive, uh, proactive uh, fixes for whatever you're, you're developing here? Well, that's certainly the, the ultimate goal here, right? To be able to feed back and also feed forward. So again, it depends, of course, what, what the problem is, right? Each situation is going to be different. Uh, the first thing here is to be able to understand what's causing the problem. Is it, a, is it a design problem? Is it a manufacturing problem? Is it a software problem? For instance, chip design uh, issues, if it's something we can trace back to, let's say, a particular layout feature or, or a cell or, or something along those lines, then, of course, that's something you want to take into consideration in future designs or future spins uh, of that design. 
And you know, part of the challenge here is that there are, there are things that can, you know, that's a very complicated process to be able to, let's say, um, tackle any type of, of situation and feed information and data uh, in the right direction. There are things here that can be, can be automated and there are things that are going to be more manual processes. But the key is to be able to, you know, everything that you have an ability to, to root costs and categorize effectively, um, you can then, you know, look at automating the, you know, the response to that, depending on, on how often the, these problems occur. And so in an automotive application, you may be looking at tolerances and saying, oh, this is now exceeding this tolerance one way or another, right? Now we have to do something about it. Yeah, that's, uh, and that's also something that is unique depending on which, you know, where your device is deployed is, you know, exactly what do you want to do about, it, right? Because in something in a car, it's a life or death type of situation potentially. So you, you want to respond in a way that you, you know, slow down and, and stop the car you know, in a, in a meaningful way, in let's say in in a data center, uh, you want to be able to also you know detect problems before they become catastrophical, right? So it it's not not just about how you respond, but also how early can you detect the problem. You really want to be able to say that hey, this chip is going to die next week. Let's you know disable it now while the system is idle. Now those are you know the the hopes and dreams um, of SLM in, in, in many ways there are, you know, that's the, the general direction that we're, that we're moving towards. We have some new elements coming in here as well, though. When you get into 2.5D, 3D type of applications and, and designs, you're also starting to deal with mechanical issues, which have never even been on anybody's radar in this industry, other than maybe the uh, fabs. Is that starting to come into these tools as well? It, it is. There are, there are many challenges with... Uh, with with multi die and with with chiplets and and it starts out even more basic than that in the sense that when you're you know assembling these things together uh, and you also have to connect together all the the different the infrastructure that's used to to detect the, like all the various types of instruments monitors sensors and such uh, so it's now even more important that all of these different you know, instruments that are maybe come from different vendors and from different places can actually talk together. So that's kind of the first thing to make sure that we have like some common infrastructure and some common language that allows us to, you know, just like we've been working on in context of 3D tests, where we have some standards and, uh, and, and mechanisms that allow us to connect all of the test structures together so we can, you know, at least access all the different sensors. Uh, we want to expand that you no know, into something that is more applicable for other types of, of sensors and monitors. And then you no, know, there's also the you know the issue with you know what happens between the die and what happens inside the package, right? That's that's kind of the next uh, set of challenges. You know, one thing is just test integrity of the signals between the die, which is usually high speed buses, right? Which is you know fa fairly complex. Uh, but then there's also, you know, you have to deal with, with the fact that maybe one die is affecting the other, right? That there's some other more, you know, complex issues that are uh, hard to detect. And yeah, it's it's starting to, to pop up. And and I, I would say that it's still something that, the, you know, the industry is, is learning how to deal with. Is one of the goals here to actually uh, reduce the amount of margin that you need in a design as well? Reducing margin is, you know, one one of the deals, and that kind of relates to what we talked about earlier about meeting multiple requirements at the same time, where you want to be you want to be as close to the edge as as you can. If if your competitor is building a, you know, three point two gigahertz device, you want to be able to sell yours as a three point three gigahertz device. There are many segments where the competition is so fierce that you want to, you know, you can't over engineer things anymore to the same degree you have to be you know be closer to the edge and and then to your insurance policy then is to be able to to test and validate and keep on testing like in in the field that uh you know your your device is still operating the way it's uh, supposed to why wasn't this done in the past did it just not exist or was it not a priority well i i think it's uh, to a certain degree in, you know, in some market segments, bits and pieces of this 
has been done, like in the automotive industry, for instance, in-system test has existed for, for the last 20, 30 years. I think, again, why it becomes more prevalent now is that you, you have applications where it is harder to, to kind of have a lot of margin for error, if you will. Uh, so where, where you have to deal with a lot of these requirements all at the same time, and uh, you're using, let's say, you, you know, very complex leading edge node devices in applications you didn't uh, do before and, and, and so forth. A lot of this came out of originally uh, on the uh, aerospace uh, defense uh, triple uh, redundant failover, where you basically had all this margin. If you two things uh, failed, you still had a third one to float around there. And if one of them failed, you took the best of uh, two. Now we're trying to say, okay, we can do this more with our capabilities on, in terms of monitoring different things, so temperature and stress and, and just about everything else. How is this changing the design process? Well, it changes the design process uh, in a couple of ways. First of all, it makes the need for more precise characterization uh, pre-silicon uh, more important. If you, you know, planning on having less slack, again, timing analysis and all that verification that you do pre-silicon now becomes, becomes critical. The other thing is that uh, when we rely more on, on measurements and sensing, it means, well, we have to insert all this in instrumentations in, in the design. And that also causes a conflict in the sense that to, for all of these measurements to be very precise, uh, you want to place sensors and monitors in, in specific locations, let's say where you have the longest paths. You don't know exactly which paths are going to be the longest until after place and route. And at that point, you don't really want to insert anything in your design, right? So it creates some challenges with respect to kind of the implementation flow that it makes it a little bit, you know, you have to make some compromises here between convenience and, and accuracy. As we get into full 3D IC types of designs, though, we're starting to also see thinner dyes. Everything's being thinned out because you want to limit the distances that signals have to travel. That speeds everything up, also reduces the amount of power. That also puts more stress on, on just about every component that's in there, though, right? So now you have to start thinking about new stuff that you didn't really have in the past. How does that fit into SOM? Is this, are, are we capable of monitoring this at this point, or is this going to be something that has to evolve? A little bit of, of both, I think. Uh, first, there are you know, capabilities that we have to you know, identify. So when things fail, for instance, we can, we can trace back a particular defect and to a, um, to let's say a layout structure or a layout shape or, you know, specific physical characteristics of, of a design. Uh, and then of course, use that information, use that going forward. But I think also there are, you know, things that can be done here to, to, you know, help us get, you know, not wait for things to fail, right. To, to improve the analysis as we do pre-silicon to, take reliability, for instance, more into consideration. You've got a lot of pieces here that are in motion too. You've got design for test, you've got design for yield, you've basically got all these other capabilities in here. How do all these pieces come together in SLM? Well, you know, I like to think of SLM as really as a journey, uh, right? There's, uh, you know, you can, you can look at all of this and think that this is more or less of a kind of a boil the ocean type of, of, of approach, but what is right for one particular uh, design, one particular system is not necessarily right uh, for the other. So what we envision will happen is that um, organizations will take you know, small steps towards being able to measure th everything all the time, right? So our approach to this is to, first of all, leverage the uh, kind of the journey that we have embarked on on test, but where where we you know we started out with uh, you know manufacturing pass fail test, we expanded that into more of a data collection yield learning uh, universe, and now we're moving all of the same capabilities that we have for manufacturing test in terms of quality and learning into in field, where it's not just about being able to. Ex uh, execute tests, but then kind of tie that into the system operation, right? So your system software has to talk to the DFT structures to initiate tests and, and then do something about the results, right? So it's like that 
interface between instrumentation and, and system operation. And that's kind of a, the backbone, if you will, of a lot of these other types of measurements, right? You have an interface between some sort of instrumentation, uh, some sort of processing, and, and some sort of reaction, right? So that that is kind of one uh, you know one one path how DFT kind of leads towards SLM. Um, another uh, key thing here is that when we're doing all of these different measurements, there's there's a lot of data. Right. And, you know, every now and then you hear people talk about that more data than I know what to do with. Well, first of all, that data needs to go somewhere. Right. So there has to be some sort of infrastructure on chip, preferably some common infrastructure. So you don't have like a whole bunch of, you know, multiple buses for different types of instrumentation. And you also want to just because you don't want to send like terabytes out of, of the chip or stream data continuously. You want to do something intelligent with the data you collect and make whatever decisions you can on chip, right? So that ability to, to do some sort of on-chip decisions and also have that common infrastructure, that also is something that kind of has its roots in DFT, right? We have Test data buses that lend themselves to also transport other types of uh, other types of data, for instance. Gerada, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be here.